Thank you very kind to my friend. As I listen to Ralph Abernathy and his eloquent and generous introduction, and uh, then thought about myself, I wonder who he was talking about. <laughs> It's always good to have your closest friend and associate to say something good about you. And Ralph Abernathy is the best friend that I have in the world. I'm delighted to see each of you here tonight in spite of a storm warning, you reveal that you are determined to go on anyhow. Something is happening in Memphis, something is happening in our world. And you know, if I were standing at the beginning of time with the possibility of taking a kind of general and panoramic view of the whole of human history up to now. And the Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? I would take my mental flight by Egypt. And I would watch God's children in their magnificent trek from the dark dungeons of Egypt through a rubber across the Red Sea through the wilderness on toward the promised land. And in spite of its magnificence, I wouldn't stop there. I would move on by Greece and take my mind to Mount Olympus. And I would see Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Euripides, and Aristophanes assemble around the Parthenon. <laughs> And I would watch them around the Parthenon as they discuss the great and eternal issues of reality, but I wouldn't stop there. I would go on even to the great heyday of the Roman Empire. And I would see developments around there through various emperors and leaders. But I wouldn't stop there. I would even come up to the day of the Renaissance and get a quick picture of all that the Renaissance did for the cultural and aesthetic life of man, but I wouldn't stop there. I would even go by the way that the man for whom I'm named had his habitat. And I would watch Martin Luther as he tacks his 95 theses on the door at the church of Wittenberg, but I wouldn't stop there. I would come on up even to 1863 and watch a vacillating president by the name of Abraham Lincoln finally come to the conclusion that he had to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, but I wouldn't stop there. <laughs> I would even come up to the early 30s and see a man grappling with the problems of the bankruptcy of his nation and come with an eloquent cry that 
We have nothing to fear but fear itself. But I wouldn't stop there. Strangely enough, I would turn to the Almighty and say, if you allow me to live just a few years in the second half of the 20th century, I will be happy. Now, that's a strange statement to make because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land. Confusion all around. That's a strange statement. But I know somehow that only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way that men in some strange way are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up. And wherever they are assembled today, whether they are in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, the cry is always the same, we want to be free. <laughs> Another reason that I'm happy to live in this period is that we have been forced to a point where we are going to have to grapple with the problems that men have been trying to grapple with through history, but the demands didn't force them to do. Survival demands that we grapple with them. Men for years now have been talking about war and peace. But now, no longer can they just talk about it. It is no longer the choice between violence and non-violence in this world. It's non-violence or non-existence. That is where we are today. Also in the human rights revolution. If something isn't done and done in a hurry to bring the colored peoples of the world out of their long years of poverty, their long years of hurt and neglect, the whole world is doomed. <laughs> now, I'm just happy that God has allowed me to live in this period, to see what is unfolding. And I'm happy that he's allowed me to be in Memphis. I can remember I can remember when Negroes were just going around as Ralph has said, so often scratching where they didn't itch and laughing when they were not tickled. <laughs> but that day is all over. <laughs> we mean business now and we are determined to gain our rightful place in God's world. And that's all this whole thing is about. We aren't engaged in any negative protest and in any negative arguments with anybody. We are saying that we are determined to be men. We are determined to be people. We are saying 
We are saying that we are God's children. And if we are God's children, we don't have to live like we are forced to live. And what does all of this mean in this great period of history? It means that we've got to stay together. We've got to stay together and maintain unity. You know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had a favorite, favorite formula for doing. What was that? He kept the slaves fighting among themselves. But whenever the slaves get together, something happens in Pharaoh's court, and he cannot hold the slaves in slavery. When the slaves get together, that's the beginning of getting out of slavery. Amen. Yes, Jesus. Now let us maintain unity. Secondly, let us keep the issues where they are. The issue is injustice. The issue is the refusal of Memphis to be fair and honest in its dealings with its public servants who happen to be sanitation workers. Now we've got to keep attention on that. That's always the problem with a little violence. You know what happened the other day and the press dealt only with the window breaking. I read the articles. They very seldom got around to mentioning the fact that 1,300 sanitation workers are on strike and that Memphis is not being fair to them and that Mayor Loeb is in dire need of a doctor. They didn't get around to that. we're going to march again and we've got to march again in order to put the issue where it is supposed to be. Force everybody to see that there are 1,300 of God's children here suffering. Sometimes going hungry, going through dark and dreary nights, wondering how this thing is going to come out. That's the issue. We've got to say to the nation, we know how it's coming out. But when people get caught up with that which is right and they are willing to sacrifice for it, there is no stopping point short of victory. <laughs> we are going to let any may stop us. We are masters in our nonviolent movement in disarming police forces. They don't know what to do. I've seen them so often. I remember in Birmingham, Alabama, we were in that majestic struggle there. We would move out of the 16th Street Baptist Church day after day. By the hundreds, we would move out. And Bill Connor would tell them to send the dogs for And they did come. We just went before the dog singing, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Mm -hmm. Will Connor next would say, turn the fire hoses on. If I said to you the other night, Will Connor didn't know history. 
He knew a kind of physics that somehow didn't relate to the trans physics that we knew about. That was the fact that there was a certain kind of fire that no water could put out. We went before the fire hoses. We had known water. If we were Baptist or some other denomination, we had been immersed. If we were Methodist and some other, we had been sprinkled, but we knew water. That couldn't stop us. We just went on before the dogs and we would look at them and we'd go on before the water hoses and we would look at it. And we just go on singing over my head, I see freedom in there. <laughs> Then we would be thrown in the paddy wagons, and sometimes we were stacked in there like sardines in a can. They would throw us in, and old bull would say, take them off. They did, and we were just thrown in the paddy wagon singing, we shall overcome. And every now and then we'd get in jail, and we'd see the jailers looking through the window, being moved by our prayer. And being moved by our words in our song, there was a power there which Bull Palmer couldn't adjust, adjust to. And so we ended up transforming Bull into a steel, and we won our struggle in Birmingham. <laughs> We've got to go on in Memphis just like that. I call upon you to be with us when we go out Monday. Now about injunction. We have an injunction and we are going into court tomorrow morning to fight this illegal, unconstitutional injunction. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. <laughs> I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country. Maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over that. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for rights. So just as I say we aren't going to let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. <laughs> we are going on. We need all of them. You know what's beautiful to me? To see all of these ministers of the gospel. It's a marvelous picture. Who is it that is supposed to articulate the longings and aspirations of the people more than the preacher? Somehow the preacher must have a kind of fire shut up in his phone. And whenever injustice is around, he must tell it. Somehow the preacher must be an Amos said, when God speaks, who can but prophesy? Again, with Amos, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Somehow the preacher must say with Jesus, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And he's anointed me to deal with the problems of the poor. 
I want to commend the preacher under the leadership of these noble men, James Lawson, one who has been in this struggle for many years. He's been to jail for struggling. He's been kicked out of Vanderbilt University for this struggling, but he's still going on fighting for the rights of his people. Reverend Ralph Jackson, Billy Child, I could just go right on down the list. Time will not permit, but I want to thank all of them. And I want you to thank them. Because so often preachers aren't concerned about anything but themselves. Amen. And I'm always happy to see a relevant ministry. It's all right to talk about long white robes over yonder in all of its symbolism. But ultimately, people want some suits and dresses and shoes to wear down here. It's all right to talk about streets flowing with milk and honey. But God has commanded us to be concerned about the slums down here and his children who can't eat three square meals a day. It's all right to talk about the new Jerusalem, but one day, God's preacher must talk about the new New York. The new Atlanta, the new Philadelphia, the new Los Angeles, the new Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> this is what we have to do. Now, the other thing we'll have to do is this. Always anchor our external direct action. with the power of economic withdrawal. Now, we are poor people. Individually, we are poor when you compare us with white society in America. We are poor. Never stop to get it. That collectively, that means all of us together, collectively we are richer than all the nations in the world with the exception of nine. Did you ever think about that? After you leave the United States, Soviet Russia, Great Britain, West Germany, France, I can name others. American Negro collectively is richer than most nations of the world. We have an annual income of more than $30 billion a year, which is more than all of the exports of the United States and more than the national budget of Canada. Did you know that? That's power right there if we know how to prove it. <laughs> We don't have to argue with anybody. We don't have to curse and go around acting bad with our words. We don't need any bricks and bubbles. We don't need any Molotov cocktails. We just need to go around to these stores and to these massive industries in our country and say, God sent us by here. To say to you that you're not treating his children right. And we come by here to ask you to make the first item on your agenda bad treatment where God's children are concerned. Now, if you're not prepared to do that, we do have an agenda that we must follow. And our agenda calls for withdrawing economic support from you. So as a result of this, we're asking you tonight to 
to go out and tell your neighbors not to buy Coca-Cola in them. <laughs> Go by and tell them not to buy chilled pest milk. Tell them not to buy what is all the bread wonder bread. Wonder bread. And what is all the bread from the dressing? Tell them not to buy hard bread. Mr. Jackson has said up to now, only the garbage men have been feeling pain. Now we must kind of redistribute the pain. We are choosing these companies because they have been paying their hiring policies. And we are choosing them because they can begin the process of saying they are going to support the needs and the rights of these men who are on strike. And then they can move on town, downtown, and tell Mayor Lowe to do what is right. And not only that, we've got to strengthen black and I call upon you to take your money out of the banks downtown and deposit your money in Tri-State Bank. We want a bank in movement in Memphis. Go by the Savings and Loan Association. I'm not asking you something that we don't do ourselves in SPLC. Judge Hooks and others will tell you that we have an account here in the state of the Loan Association from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We are telling you to follow what we are doing. Put your money there. You have six or seven black insurance companies here in the city of Memphis. Take out your insurance there. We want to have an insurance in. Now, these are some practical things that we can do. We begin the process of building a great economic base. And at the same time, we are putting pressure where it really hurts. I ask you to follow through here. Now, let me say as I move to my conclusion. that we've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. We've got to see it through. When we have our march, you need to be there. If it means leaving work, if it means leaving school, be there. <laughs> be concerned about your brother. You may not be on track. But either we go up together or we go down together. <laughs> Let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. One day a man came to Jesus. And he wanted to raise some questions about some vital matters of life. At points he wanted to trick Jesus and show him that he knew a little more than Jesus knew and throw him off base. Now that question could have easily ended up in a philosophical and theological debate. But Jesus immediately 
pulled that question from midair and placed it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho. He talked about a certain man who fell among thieves. You remember that a Levite? The priest passed by on the other side. They didn't stop to help him. Finally, a man of another race came by. He got down from his beast, decided not to be compassionate by proxy. But he got down with him, administered first aid, and helped the man in need. Jesus ended up saying this was the good man, this was the great man. Because he had the capacity to project the eye into the barn to be concerned about his problem. Now, you know, we use our imagination a great deal to try to determine why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. At times, we say they were busy going to a church meeting, an ecclesiastical gathering, and they had to get on down to Jerusalem so they wouldn't be late for their meeting. At other times, we would speculate that there was a religious law that one who was engaged in religious ceremonial was not to touch a human body 24 hours before the ceremony. And every now and then we began to wonder whether maybe they were not going down to Jerusalem, down to Jericho rather, to organize a Jericho Road Improvement Association. That's a possibility. Maybe they felt that it was better to deal with the problem from the causal root rather than to get bogged down with an individual effect. I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. It's possible that those men were afraid. You see, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. I remember when Mrs. King and I were first in Jerusalem. We rented a car and drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And as soon as we got on that road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this as the setting for his parable. It's a winding, meandering road. It's really conducive for ambushing. You start out in Jerusalem, which is about 1,200 miles, or rather 1,200 feet above sea level. And by the time you get down to Jericho, 15 or 20 minutes later, you're about 2,200 feet below sea level. That's a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the bloody paths. You know it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and Wondered if the robbers were still around. Or it's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely taken. And he was acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there, lure them there for quick and easy siege. And so the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by, and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the question before you tonight. Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to my job? Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to all of the hours that I usually spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor? The question is not, if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? The question is, if I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? That's the question. <laughs> rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand 
with a greater determination. Let us move on. In these powerful days, these days of challenge, to make America what it ought to be, we have an opportunity to make America a better nation. And I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. While sitting there autographing books, the minute black woman came up, the only question I heard from her was, you, Martin Luther King, and I was looking down writing, and I said, yes. The next minute, I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. That blade had gone through and the x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. And once that's punctured, you drowned in your own blood. That's the end of you. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, they allowed me, after the operation, after my chest had been opened and the blade had been taken out, to move around in the wheelchair in the hospital, they allowed me to read some of the mail that came in. And from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. I read a few, but one of them I will never forget. I had received one from the president and the vice president. I have forgotten what those telegrams said. I had received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I have forgotten what that letter said. But there was another letter. It came from a little girl, a young girl who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter, and I'll never forget it. it said, simply, dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. She said, while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read in the paper, of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. And I want to say tonight, I want to say tonight that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960. And students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream, taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, if I had sneezed. I wouldn't have been around here in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and ended segregation in interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1962. Negroes in Albany, Georgia, decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, if I had sneezed, I would have been here in 1963. Black people of Birmingham, Alabama, aroused the conscience of this nation, 
brought into being the Civil Rights Bill if I had sneezed. I wouldn't have had a chance later that year in August to try to tell America about a dream that I had had if I had sneezed. I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama to see the great movement there if I had sneezed. I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sleep. They were telling me. Now it doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning and as we got started on the plane, there were six of us. The pilot said over the public address system, we are sorry for the delay. But we have Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure that all of the bags were checked. And to be sure that nothing would be wrong on the plane, we had to check out everything carefully. And we've had the plane protected and guarded all night. And then I got into Memphis. And some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. What would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop. <laughs> Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Not all.